All right. So, Shay, welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Yes. Yes. Um, so before we get started, I want you to go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone uh, and just tell a little bit about what you do. Okay. Um, well, my name is Shay Jones, and I am a producer and director here in Atlanta. And it's been an ongoing journey. It's funny because it's like whenever I say the titles, it rarely really kind of gives any indication of what I'm doing and what that means. So I'm sure we'll get into that. But, um, you know, I'm all things production. And on the creative side, it's still mainly just in the execution of production. Mm -hmm. It's not nearly as much like I love working with a creative director in an agency. Um, so yeah, it wouldn't be on that prep side of it, but I take their vision and I'm able to get it for them. The first question I want to ask you is how did you get to this point, right? Was it just something that you, uh, have always been passionate about or did you just kind of drop into it? Yeah. So I, I actually, for me to get started where I am now, it's funny. I started on camera. Um, I moved to LA when I was 16 years old with you know i want to be a movie star <laughs> and um i got there and loved the experience and i actually you know i was able to do a lot on set it was mainly national commercials and then i did a uh, character on stranger things season two episode two and then um what was the other? oh awkward on mtv um uh, i forgot that show existed <laughs> and and then while i was on set this is when i started to really I think came into more of when I really hit me of where I wanted to go with it was sitting in the trailer for seven hours, being hand fed by a grape is just very weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's not my thing. And I was starting to notice, you know, people running around, like trying to put out fires and seeing why the director wanted to, you know, set up in that way and really pay attention in that world. So I realized, okay, I, I found it close, but not super as, you know, where I needed to go. And I actually, I stayed out in LA for around six years and timed out back moving to Georgia because my parents were actually living in uh, Peachtree City. So I finished school up at Kennesaw State University. And I always hate saying this because I'm not against school, but school had nothing to do with what I did. <laughs> uh, it was a promise to my dad to just get a degree. So I majored in media and entertainment, but it really had no ability for me i would say with connections to get into it um the moment that i graduated i instantly went on linkedin like i'm sure everyone does in any form of job searching and the first thing that i was able to get an interview on was actually with a post-production company in atlanta called tube mm -hmm. and so i had no interest in getting into post-production whatsoever but i was like you need to start somewhere so got in there, started working and immediately knew, you know, that wasn't going to be the space where I grew, but the people coming in and the different client meetings and just learning about how it works without the pressure of truly leading it was honestly something that I think a lot of people like to skip that step. And I would argue against it. I would say it's very, very important to just kind of have a moment where you're just ears on the wall without the pressure. So you're just a sponge and you're soaking it up. Um, and then there was this one time where ESPN client walks into the office and I just brought up all of a sudden, I was like six months there and I just brought up like a solution in the meeting. And I was like, can I just say that out loud? <laughs> like, oh no. And it led to them saying, well, you know what? We want you to fly out to Pasadena for our Heisman house shoot. And I was like, what? like, okay. And like, and then I look at my boss, wait, am I okay to do that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so did it. And then truly from that moment on, what I learned was, especially if you're going on the production route, I would have to, have to split it for the directing and producer. But I started in production, so I'll go there, was never, ever, ever getting tired of thinking. It's when everyone around you who's above the line is tired and doesn't want to think about it, you're not stopping. Like your, I was in my hotel room thinking about a solution of we don't have the ball pump on the day. What are we going to do? You know, things where I am, I noticed that where I became very much wanted and needed on set was I was the fixer when they didn't even know problems would happen. I was able to just jump in. Yeah. And so that's where I would say like 
with production. That's how I really started. And then to go on with ESPN, I started getting their, uh, coordinating their tours with Samsung and ESPN. And I would travel out each weekend for every single college football game. And then it just led to me meeting more people and kind of being able to take on more and offering, you know, hey, I can do this now. I can take this on. But so you started off in acting, right? Yeah. Yeah. So which for me, it shows that, you know, not only in front of the camera, behind the camera, all the details that are, that are involved with that. Um, what made you want to get into acting in the first place? And that, you know, I would say the biggest thing with me was growing up, I was always like labeled as a big, big family extended. It was just like entertainer and thinking of like, you know, playing around, goofball and that aspect. But it was right. also, I think, life experiences at like young ages of like, I was able to pull from places that a 16 year old really isn't able to normally. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to bring stuff out. And that's why I, I, I still today will promise everyone should do an acting class. Um, it's something that once you, you get into it, I, I honestly, yeah, I don't even have a great answer. It was something that at 16, there was no one able to convince me that that's not what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and so I somehow convinced my parents to let me go. <laughs> uh, but then I think what's really cool, what I'm finding now is getting into the directing role. I have an ability to connect with the talent, whether that be, you know, just a football player who's not really pulling, not getting deep. Um, but we need a genuine, you know, reaction or something. Mm -hmm. I can get in that headspace to connect with them, to understand, okay, you know, with a football player, like a lot of those for me, it helps me know, okay, they're not that comfortable doing this. This is not what they're doing. So how am I getting get them out of their skin and being able to keep it organic to them? Because that's the type of stuff that I notice as an actor. You go to acting classes and you love it. Like full blown three hours, you're having the best monologue or the best um, you know, on scene partner. But then you get on set and it's very much like get in place. Cool. Great. You look great. Awesome. Did you say your line. All right. Thank you. Wrap yeah. up today. Right. <laughs> and you just kind of feel all jerked around and then, you know, they're in the edit and they're like, oh, we didn't get a great reaction. from her. Right. And it's like something like that where I'm like, okay, you know, that's just not giving enough room and enough time. And I think that's where the prep really comes in. Yeah. And I think that's huge. Um, the fact that you not only were an actor for so long, actress for so long, and now you're behind the camera that you actually know how to communicate with not only talent, but also with crew, which is, is massive, right? Cause you don't get a lot of that um, in the industry, especially with um, some new directors that are coming up. They just, you know, they go, they train or they have experience just, just in directing, but not have never played a role in the acting game. So that's, that's very interesting. No. And that you're, you're dead on with that. And I think that's, where it was really cool to have gone up with acting out of my head now for the last, you know, nine years. And it's just being the other stuff. It's kind of like learning all the technical, getting a bid from my gaffer and looking at the equipment list and not feeling like, oh, I have no idea what any of this means. So I can't push back. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, now I know exactly what everything on that list is. So I can communicate to him, hey, I know you want to do a, you know, 12 by softbox, it's not in the budget. Can we do, you know, a menace arm with your C stands and just do a light mat over and being able to communicate that, but still giving the client what they're wanting is something that I didn't necessarily think I had to do, but I was so tired of kind of getting put in a corner as a producer where you're like, Hey, the budget matters so much. Don't like overspend at all, but here's a whole curriculum and things that you have no knowledge on, but just help make sense of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're That's, you're just the admin at that point, right? Yeah. Your job is to make sure everything's on time and that the budget is being met. Exactly. And that that's where I don't know, production something where what I always say, you know, whatever messes up or somebody told me this, sorry, is whatever messes you up in life is what makes you really good at your job. <laughs> oh, that's very good. I like yeah. that. So, it's kind of, you know, putting out fires but then also being able to be the the captain that it doesn't matter which side, whether that be the talent or whether that be my key grip, both sides are happy because I understand both sides. It just makes the day so much smoother. And then what you get in return versus what you didn't because 
you didn't have the time or I didn't understand something. So I wasn't able to talk through it. It's no one likes to be on that spot on the day when you know you could have gotten better shots and you didn't. And there's no good reason. What's something that, you know, you wish that a lot of people understood um, when it comes to being a producer? Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's like a, it's a loaded answer. <laughs> it is. Um, I'd say there's, it's from multiple different viewpoints. I can give different answers. So from crew side, I think a lot of crew doesn't understand that, you know, the amount of unpaid days that go with getting the job just to get them on the amount of calls and the amount of zoom calls, the amount of lines out in the water that you may or may not ever see. You may get that job. You may not get that job. It's just you having to be attentive, responding to their emails, giving the people the reassurance that, you know, you should come to me because I can do this. But then I've done it where I've been back and forth with a client for three weeks straight all day and then nothing happens from it. And so there's moments where sometimes I think crew when, I don't know if you know, if you've noticed this, but there's like this new wave going around, especially in Atlanta because it's so busy where there's a sense of almost entitlement and don't get me wrong. Like my crew is like, I'll fight till the end of birth. <laughs> and you're saying them. entitlement from the uh, client side or the crew side? The crew side. Crew side. Sense, okay. Yeah. Just in the sense of um, rates. And now they're like, well, if I have to go, you know, do a run or something like that. And I'm not saying this is everyone whatsoever, but I think it would be nice just for them to really understand that there's so many details 24 seven. There's so many meetings to keep up with. There's so many networking things that don't even result with you in a job. But the moment that you need a pyrotechnic, you don't want to have to call on that pyrotechnic and build a relationship that day. You want to already be like, hey, man, what's going on? Like, how about the kids? And then they'll work with you on numbers. So the amount of time that a producer truly needs in a day just doesn't ever add up. Um, because to do it all correctly, it's, there's never an off day. Um, and then from the client side, I would say something that they probably don't know is a lot of times for me, if it's like, you know, if I'm working with a client like the Disney or Coca-Cola, they're a huge machine and that's awesome. And it's always great job. But with that, you know, the, the amount of resources they have, the amount of different departments that they have in-house and they don't have to go outside or it's not a one person or a three person team putting together a 85, you know, crew member shoot. And you're dependent on making that next move for one piece of information that they're not giving yet. Mm -hmm. And that's a moment that I think sometimes can be a little frustrating just because I get it. Like you guys are massive. And this is one small enchilada, but for us, this is like a big, big burrito. <laughs> right. We need that one little chunk to be able to fold, you know, the tortilla. So that's something where I don't think they necessarily see it just because they're not usually boots on the ground. Yep. And that's just, I mean, it's all very small. And it's always the, the bigger game of, I don't know, like this crazy world we live in, but. I would say from an outsider that's not in the industry, something that they don't know about production in general and producing would be they see the glam. They see you get to hang out with celebrities. You get to hang out. <laughs> yeah. uh, you get to you know go to amazing restaurants. You get to travel. And while a lot of that is true and beyond grateful for it, there's so much like more to get that. 10 second life to the five. Yeah. Um, and that's something that I don't think a lot of people know. I would agree with that 100%. And I'm curious if to, you know, because you, you use the word entitlement in this, and, and this was pertaining to crew and for client. And why, where do you think that come from? That comes from exactly. I think the only thing that I would say, like the only thing that would be possible, it's just the amount of jobs and the amount of, that's busy. It's never personal. Like I don't, it's something that I've just kind of seen growing and changing because like i mean obviously like the crew that i would love to always get on everything they are not within this that i'm speaking on whatsoever but whenever you know let's say all my go-to positions are filled and we need to fill in someone i've noticed that there's very much like a 
I won't work lower than this, even though that rate is something, a new standard that I didn't get a piece of or what is going on. Yeah. Um, and there's just a different conversation, I guess, like the starter. And I always will work it out and we'll always find a way to make it work. But I think the initial jump off just has a little bit more of a sharper tool, I guess. Now, speaking of tools, do you have a specific one that you're always either carrying with you or whether it's a uh piece of software so yeah software i would say showbiz budgeting is my like saving grace <laughs> um it's something that I, I wish like i mean i would do a commercial for them instantly <laughs> um they they just figured it out so the templates that you can get from them that they would just give to you it has everything that you would need whether you're doing a netflix million like a 300 million dollar picture or you're doing a $20,000 videographer budget. And the way that it's just set up with keeping all your invoices and PDFs and your PO logs and your petty cash logs, it just makes it all very easy. I honestly don't know. It's been a long time since I've done a job without it. <laughs> um, and then I would say outside of that and just what we use like internally is Google and it's the Google Workplace. I mean, it's phenomenal of just having shareable documents and just fast, quick, when it comes to Google Sheets, I'd say we use that for crew booking and just having a roster at all times, whether that be job specific or just a basic, like almost like CDM um, and DocuSign. I'd say DocuSign is how I get the fastest invoices and W9s from crew because mm -hmm. it's just pre-labeled, they go to it and it makes them jump and all they have to do is type. Um, and then I also do DocuSign for things like you know, whether we have to do crew, uh, crew deal memos or we do, you know, lunch order ahead of time of shoot um, or COVID compliance questionnaires. As COVID came in, it did change a lot and it changed kind of like how the organization comes with it because it changed the budget, it changed, I mean, there's new crew, COVID compliance officer. So that was something that just figuring that part out of what's the best way because every company had different policies and guidelines that we had to then execute. So whether it's still just, you know, a Shake Studios production, we still have to execute on Disney standards, blah, blah, blah standards, so on and so forth. So that's something with having like a Google workplace where we can all have eyes on it. It's, I don't know how we would do it. <laughs> so it, it's very interesting because there's some, some of the tools that you mentioned there, we don't use on our end, but I'm definitely going to look into them. So if we were to go back, right, to Shay, once you first started, way, way back, okay, is what piece of information or let's say advice would you give to her? I would give to her, well, that's a good question. Um, looking back, I would tell her, pump the brakes. It's okay. Um, not that I would regret doing anything. And I know that I just know myself I would have done it regardless if someone told me not to, which I'm sure people did in my life. <laughs> um, but it was something of the pressure, I would say. That's, it's very easy to feel a lot of pressure in this industry, especially when you're starting alone as a freelancer. You don't have a backing. So, you know, your dinner that you're going to eat that night is based on how much did you hustle that week. So it was a hard balance of, okay, just graduated, young 20s, but already feeling late already feeling like oh i'm behind that's something that i wish i would just been able to say enjoy it more because i look back and what i've been able to do is very rare from other people in my industry and i'm very aware of that from a grateful standpoint because i know that there's veterans out there that you know pa'd for seven years a lot of my peers that's the case and i very much just hit the ground running and never stopped, I think for like three years. And I looked up and I'm like, whoa, like, yeah. we really did this. Like we're here. So yeah, I think that's what I would say. Where do you think that hustle comes from? Um, you know, I've always said this and I don't even know where this came from. I've said this, I mean, I said this when I lived in LA. So um, it's hustle or get hustled. I think I could definitely throw it to my dad um, growing up. He just, I mean, I never even sat, saw him sitting down. And he was a VP sales for 
Georgia Pacific. And he started, though, in the paper mill with a broom in his hand. So for him to go all the way up and go to VP sales and, you know, get to do the things he got to do and just seeing the time that he would always make for the family and always the balancing of all of it and the human in him, honestly, I think is what kind of instilled it in me of, you know, the world is what you want. And if you want to go up and if you want to be that title, and yes, there's going to be hundreds of people, which there was in my case, that told me, Shay, like, not even a male director is happening until they're like 45. And I was like, okay, I mean, that's cool for them. <laughs> like, I, I, never, I don't hear it. <laughs> um, and I think that's really what it is. That's something that I don't know. I don't know if, if there's a way to learn that. It would be great to learn because I yeah. would have loved to have gotten that earlier. I think it's, no, I think, I think that's something that is in you, you know, that's definitely that is instilled in you maybe at a young, young age, or you just were in an environment where you just needed to evolve into this person. Oh, I mean, it's beyond like, it's something it's exciting though. I think there's two different types of people where, you know, it's easy to maybe get intimidated by that. Like you can do and be and see whatever you want to see in this lifetime. Some people are going to go, whoa, that's just a lot. Can I just like, you know, have a nine to five and start there? And that's amazing. We need those people. <laughs> like, I'm loving that. But then there's, there's the other that like, for me, I get so excited by that. I'm like, so truly, I don't know if tomorrow I'm going to get a phone call that's going to lead me to go do a documentary in India. Like amazing. <laughs> yeah. And so that's just where, yeah, the hustle and the grind. That's kind of how I knew this industry was the one. Was there a moment where you were already knew what you wanted to do and say, oh, I want to direct or were you kind of like, oh, I want a DP or I want a grip or whatever in the moment? So I would say first jump, it actually was directing um, that it was clear, but I didn't even necessarily. I only saw a director on the day, so I didn't even necessarily really knew or understand what it meant or the path, like anything really about it. I just knew that that's what I wanted because I was always like, there's a, such a good difference between a great director from an actor standpoint compared. Uh, but with falling into production first, not, you, you don't really get that handoff, you know, for directing. It was weird because, you know, once you're in production, your lineage of path is very much like you're supposed to go from, you know, PA coordinate, blah, 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 producer. And I don't know a lot of, especially female producers, that would also be booked by a DP to be B cam operator. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I made sure to keep up with doing was because I didn't want to be the director that was just good with the actor on set and didn't understand, you know, the right storyboards and the shot list and being truly more of the technical director from the advanced point. I didn't want to just be like, well, I can get him to smile. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was very important to me of understanding what makes a frame a frame what do we want to fill it with what is that director going to tell the dp to then tell me to get because i want to see what that person's thinking but then the very next day jumping and i'm the producer on a different commercial entirely and it was really really weird at first because people were like wait what because there'd be the same crew like in between yeah. and they're like what are you doing i'm like i don't know <laughs> but it worked because i'm someone that i don't like to not understand something and I think the biggest misconception from a producer is that all you need to know is budgets and paperwork and people. The more you know about the equipment, about the camera itself, the, you know, asking the right questions for the agency or the post team on, you know, what frame rate, all of those different things. And you're not just asking it because you have this template of things to ask, but because it matters to that specific creative. That was my combo but yeah it was definitely first stab i was like i'm gonna be a director but didn't know what that meant <laughs> gotcha and so you went on that path of producing but then the director's still in there it's still wanting to fight right and it, yes like it, it's been funny because at first i kind of like i was able to tame that i was just so focused on getting better at producing because i did go up the path of coordinator pm to producer so it was something that that one I really did fight for, I would say more, 
And so I was way more focused on that. I just wanted to keep getting better and better, better. And then as soon as I was really getting to a comfort level with producing, I would start to notice whether, you know, this creative had a director attached to it from the get point. And now this director is flying into town and they arrive and I'm like, that's what we did. <laughs> that's, that's the plan. <laughs> and that's when I'm like, you know what? This is your show. I'm just the producer. But that's when I started to hear that voice again. Because I want to know about the Shake Hay Studios, right? So mm -hmm. when did you decide to do that? So that's, it's funny. It was something that kind of was decided for me in a weird way. It was something where I started as a freelancer doing all of that. And then it got to the point where I was getting known for a lot of other companies, whether that be New York, Nashville, or LA as being their Atlanta resource. Mm -hmm. And with Atlanta, like I was to say, especially like, you know, six, seven years ago, I mean, it was insane. So it was, I started to just needed to know more people in production to be able to call on, to say, Hey, can you maybe, you know, prep this the first day with just locations and stuff, just give them to me. I'll report it with the calls. And then all of a sudden I'm like looking around and we're always all together. And I'm like, what are we doing? Like I, we have a company. <laughs> and so that's when, boom, we did it, created the company. And then really started to now focus more on, you know, where's the company want to go rather than it just being me. And at first it was scary because you're like, I fought so hard to get to this level. Like that was me. I'm the one, but it reached a point where I was led to two options. It was either this is as big as it's going to get. I can't scale up more because I don't want to ever say yes. And then not really be able to be that back and forth. So it was like, or I open my hands and I got to give the reins a little bit and I got to trust more people within production and also finding the right people that are excited by this. That's something from all of a sudden, just a producer based on the production. Now I'm like an employer mm. and making sure that the right team is not just necessarily, I don't want mini me. It's, it's are we all aligned? Are we all, you know, feeling their purpose being served? Because what I noticed is, you know, if someone isn't getting to do what they're wanting to do or feel what they're wanting to feel, that's when, you know, they go MIA and maybe the, the deadline drops. So that's something that I think a lot of companies don't take enough time on. Mm -hmm. And the more that they're excited, that makes me more excited. Yeah. So the more that right now, what's really cool is, with me going into directing, I don't like to be the producer and the director. I'll be involved with production if it's gonna be run through, but having you know someone within the company, like she's gonna be able to be the producer for it and not having to worry about that and giving the trust of like, okay, she knows the crew that we would wanna use for this and she knows like all the same software and all of that. It's, it helps me go into it and really just focus on the creative. And that's something that, yeah, I'm very, very, very grateful for. Nice. And so is, uh, is your studio, is it very outward facing um, or is it more partner based as far as like um, you want to partner, you partner a lot with agencies or is it sometimes in some cases you are the agency kind of deal? So I will say the only time that Shakespeare studios would ever really kind of dabble in the, agency world would be strictly music videos just because all of the clients that we do have in the commercial world and in you know whether that be brand content whether that be epks they usually are always attached to their agency of record already and they're a much bigger scale uh, i feel like i don't know what it is but as soon as there's i'd say a minimum of like 120 budget then there's going to be four different companies on every call <laughs> yes and and it's it's good it's bad it's messy it's great it's like all of it it's a, it's really cool it's a always you can never have the same project twice right but really i would say when it comes to developing owning the creative from ground floor that really is only in music video world and i'm very particular about music video world um no with no shade out there at all <laughs> It's just, I feel like any production company in Atlanta has probably endured an Atlanta music video and some like to stay there and some run. Exactly. <laughs> um, and they're fun, they're cool, but I don't, 
the creative part that we would want to add to it is rarely in the rap world. Mm-hmm. So it's very much if it's a different genre um, without also going strictly just country, more into that like alternative or um, like R and B world. That's that's where you can still have fun, but that's definitely not our focus. Oh yeah, all of the agencies that I was able to get a hold of were truly, I mean, nonstop reach outs. LinkedIn, I don't think enough people in production use it because they think of it more either to just work for an agency to get a job or it's just business or it's just sales. And what I like couldn't disagree more. Um, I've met and gotten so many jobs through LinkedIn just building the relationship. It's not that the job's on LinkedIn. It's not that there's a job posting on the LinkedIn. It's seeing that that person what they hold, what they get excited about, what they post that they get to do in their project, knowing when to go to them with an idea or, you know, building the relationships with the talent also, such like an importance. Like, I truly believe the reason, like we just got a job for, you know, getting to direct and produce uh, Trey Young with Trident. Oh, nice. Tru- truly, truly, truly believe it's because we've worked with Trey before. And CAA was like, okay, yeah, he had a great experience with that. I don't know that to be the case. I can't say that's for sure. But I know that all of a sudden, like from the top, everyone relaxes. Um, so knowing when to pull and position your relationships, but also going to get that cup of coffee, even when you don't want to, mm-hmm. because of that LinkedIn message, he goes, hey, I'm free at 8 a.m. next Thursday. You're getting up and you're going with no expectations. That's the best way I would say to get to an agency. But to that point, you have to have something to show. Mm -hmm. So you can't go and reach out to them just to say, hey, I'm someone that's excited, but I have nothing to show you that I can do it. So that's where it does get tricky. And it gets tricky in the aspect of, okay, do you spend a lot of money on specs? And I have a love-hate relationship with spec commercials. I believe in them, but they need to make sense. And they need to make, the time of them, the execution, the, are you focusing more on the client direct? Are you just wanting, you know, Bridgestone to love this tire? Or are you wanting to make it look like there was a copyright scripting and you really did the prep on it with shop boards and all of that? Well, then that would be a better piece to show to agencies, in my opinion. So if you don't have anything and if you're a brand new company, it's getting your heads together and figuring out where the company wants to go. That's another important thing. I very, very much so have never stepped into the tabletop world just because I know what happens is once you get known for that and you can do it, you'll get beyond busy. Like don't get me wrong, but you're there then. And that wouldn't help me show that, hey, Red Bull, I can do this. This huge like thing, like for the Winter Olympics, I can totally do that. Well, my tabletop milkshake, you know, won't help me in a spec. Right. So it's, that's where I think it's just collaboration and building at the right time inside. Right. Because specs, specs start to add up. Instead of specs, because they're obviously going to be time consuming and you have to put some money into it. What was the other option that you said? So what I would say is, is like, let's say you freelance produce, but your company didn't produce those. As long as you are able to find a way to very like you're not trying to hide that you fully produce that as your company you're owning it that you were mm-hmm. a freelance producer but it shows that the level of scale of execution and if it's close to where that agency kind of overall is commercially then that is a great starting point and i don't think a lot of people feel comfortable to do that just because they're like well my company didn't do it and it's like okay well every company had to have their first project did they have the right people at that company? The big production companies, they all came from other productions. So it's like, it wasn't hard for one company to then all of a sudden give it to, you know, Hardison out in LA, but they had to have a first production. Everyone does. So I think if you find a way where you can represent those work and you make sure it's known, but you also have, you know, more people on your team to also have that, whether that be a, you know, producer DP combo. Okay, well, what's that DP DP? Because that's where it gets a little bit more convenient if you do have someone like that on your team, because a DP rarely, you know, is the production company at all for a shoot. So it's 
mainly like he's like I executed everything you saw but it wasn't my company and that rarely ever affects that so having the right team with the right experience and just finding a clean easy way of a website I know people think websites are dumb but it's single-handedly like to make or break as far as the reaching out to the clients you said LinkedIn is number mm -hmm. one and then of course networking right with these people and yeah you know you spruced in a little bit taking them the coffee and and all that stuff which is a hundred percent correct and how you should do things these days because one of the main things that I get a lot is a lot of emails from people and I don't know if this pertains to you as well but a lot of the times it's just very uh, dead emails, templates, stuff that is very heartless that people don't really care about, um, that they just scooped off the internet somewhere and they sometimes will put, put it inside of LinkedIn, right? And they didn't take the time to actually look to see what the need, right? What you were saying uh, before was. And so um, is there another way that they can go about this? Yeah, I mean, I would say sadly, cold calling like genuinely just calling it might get you somewhere in my experience the the direct just to call whether that be an agency or anyone it's going to be very much what you'll get on the other end is oh yeah you know send an email to our info at blah 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 and it kind of leads you to that same level so what i would say if linkedin truly didn't exist and it was a great point what you brought up about the copy and paste you know like hey i just want to you know i'm excited i'm out here blah blah, blah. it's that I just, I just yourself. put those in the trash. I just put them in the <laughs> trash. Like exactly. I, I, they come in, I just go trash, spam, you know? And what I always say is you have to ask yourself what would make you take time out of your day when you had a whole day with or without hearing from that person? What's going to make you stop to reply? And if you humanize it in the aspect of just yourself and then you get into the other person's headspace, like, okay, so if I'm reaching out right now to an agency producer, it's mid-February. It's the heart of their season of with their creative decks. I know that they have no time. Maybe going about it in the aspect of looking at that specific person's work and finding, you know, a humor aspect, going along with the lines of, you know, showing them a moment where you're like, hey, I already know you're probably completely overwhelmed, overworked, but I would hate to, you know, not let you know that this hot shot company is right here to take pressure off. Mm -hmm. And showcasing and knowing when to put certain videos in and it's honestly it's there's a keep it simple but enough fluff and enough personality where that one email they almost felt like they did just get a cup of coffee with you but not oh my god i can't even get to the bottom of this email <laughs> yep so i'm i would struggle honestly like if it's not just emails or linkedin it's relationship based on who you know right now i think a lot of people think they need this person up at the top of you know whatever company to really then network and it's really where when you start to look around whether that be you guys are all just starting out well you know what does your family do you look what do they do like blah blah, blah and you start just kind of pulling it out and then connecting right the most the most that i've experienced is the person that i get to is not my end goal that person's going to lead me to my end goal. Mm -hmm. If everyone looks at their first established connection as, oh, that's it. I just hit the grand slam. Then it's not going to go that far because that person doesn't know you anything. Right. And also knowing the time of when to reach back out. Right. So giving them space, letting them know it's you, you're here, your capabilities, blah, blah, blah. You, they might have an amazing reply, but you're not going to reply to that immediately because they do have their whole week and they have their own stuff and knowing when okay it's been about three and a half weeks i'm going to reach back out and just check in see how they feel that i'm not kidding doing that just alone gave us three jobs in the last month mm -hmm. because it's all of a sudden it's like oh my god yeah i did remember you like the first time and then now i'm like oh now i need you <laughs> yeah um but yeah it's really hard i'd say yeah and the to add to what you were saying I think it also comes down to just caring, right? Um, because we get so used to, we get so caught up in the industry and about what the next job is and um, what project we're going to be on that we just forget that we're all human, right? And that we're all going for the same goal. And 
you know, when we're prospecting or trying to network with someone, we always have this ulterior motive to where, okay, what's this person going to get me? Um, instead of just caring to say, okay, what can I do for you? What, how can I add value to your life, right? Whether it be through a you know, relationship or whether it be through business. So that's something that uh, I always seem to find just talking to people in general that it, people sometimes approach me and I can already tell within 30 seconds that they want something for me. And it shouldn't be that way. It should be, you know, hey, okay, I just want to meet you. I want your intriguing. I want to know more about you. I want to know more about your company. If nothing comes out of that, fine. At least we're, we can become friends, you know? So just to add a little, little sprinkle to what you, you were saying there, so. No, completely. It's, it's right on it. I think it makes it even easier, though, when you do think about it and you humanize everything like that, because the pressure is off because if you see that conversation only be successful, whether or not they offer something to you, then you're going to be really having some rough days. <laughs> it's, it, I get excited to learn about what excites someone else, even if we're in total same world, outside of the same world. Because at the end of the day, what we do with what we shoot is we're shooting humans. Mm -hmm. Like we are literally trying to capture the human. And so I think sometimes all the fluff and all of the business side of it comes and it gets and messes what we wanted to always stay, you know, beautifully free. So it's a hard combination, but I think once you think about, okay, if I actually take interest about what they do rather than trying to make them in the sudden second be obsessed with what I do mm. maybe they will actually be excited to let me know more and I might understand more and I might honestly just learn more about what an agency really is from A to Z that's knowledge that I needed I didn't get a job so good meeting you thank you so much hope to work with you so it's it's what you win from each relationship is not necessarily a job yes I agree with you. And as a producer, as a director, you know that it's not, it, you know, doing the job is only like 30% of it. You know, the rest is all about managing people and expectations. So um, as soon as people can get that, that nailed down and not say, okay, we're going to shoot with the Alexa Mini, you know, we're going to shoot with the LF today and, the, you know, with this glass and we're going to be doing this and this and this, but yet you don't even talk to your client or, find out what they actually want. That's the problem. So, you know, I, I want to know for you, what's something that kind of brought you to that, right? What's something that drives you to continue to chase this dream of being a director? I think there's, there's two folds to it of what just passion of what makes me, that's where I want to go. That mainly truly of what kind of what we were touching on just a second ago of the humanizing of it. There's something to be said that like after, and it might be, that's what's so funny. I'm making it seem like we're making this like deep psycho thriller or something. It might truly be <laughs> like a Cheetos commercial. Right. There's no emotional depth, but when you're there and you get to just capture, whether that be a Super Bowl fan sitting on the couch and you know that you're going to either make people laugh at home and you think about it like that, even though you don't, it, people don't go deep enough even though the matter might be superficial. It's still what's going to set that ad out from the others is did you capture what it really truly feels as if what those people look like on TV? Do you feel it from inside my TV while they're sitting there? It's something where you can see a lot of those ads kind of feel lifeless, even though they're smiling and they're laughing, but the way it was cut because maybe they didn't get enough shots because they didn't prep enough. It just very much just is eh, not bad or good. I think that's when I really, really knew that that's what I want to do because I think there's no shoot ever that doesn't have the ability to make someone feel something. Whatever that something is, that's what I am excited for each day of when I get the task to do that and figuring out where that emotional depth is and where it's going and then making sure we can execute it. And being the leader of that where, sure, yeah, my treatment might sound awesome, but for this budget and for this crew size and for this allotted time for the talent, can we do it? 
now we are playing a Rubik's cube. <laughs> right. And it's 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 fun. And I think the reason why I feel more confident, I would say, going into it is knowing production. Knowing when I can push my DP to think of a different way of to still give me the same lighting. But I know the budget. I know where we need to stay within. And I'm never gonna have the agency you know, breathing down my line producer's neck saying, this director is crazy. <laughs> like they're asking for everything. That's something that I think I'm going to really be able to get cool projects with really cool um, agencies just because I respect that and I understand that from the get-go. Everyone's going to have wants and wishes as a director that are absurd, but having the ability to you know be agile of okay i still want it to look like that but there's other ways to do it yes and that's that's where i would say like it's fun because i'm using both sides of my brain and prep but then on the day it's strictly i remove all of those thoughts and it's just looking at my frame and everything in the frame does it make sense it to be in there yeah i'm so ocd about that <laughs> do you feel do you feel sometimes that it can it can handicap you a little bit um, and I'll kind of dive a little deeper on that. So for example, um, when I was producing way back in the day and I was like in this transition that you were in with directing as well, um, I would always have this mentality of like, okay, so if the budget is $50,000, right. And you're like, okay, I was a producer before now I'm a director now, but I'm still going to be very, uh, cautious of this budget. Right. So, but then a lot of directors who never had this producing experience would just be like, hell no, we want, uh, you know, $50,000. I want to have a techno crane out there. I want to have this guy here. I want to have the, and now the budget's like 75,000 to 100,000 for this shoot. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that kind of handicaps you a little bit uh, from the creative standpoint a little bit? And I would say there's a yes and no. It depends, I'd say, on the amount of prep I'm given. I think when I have, you know, I would say three weeks of here's where the budget window is. Within that three weeks, we're going to have a pre-pro meeting. We're going to have locations booked. We're going to have crew booked, bud like bids awarded, all of that. That is more than enough time for me to always have a line producer. That's not me. I always am making sure of that. I won't wear true hats of it, but because, you know, it's, evolving right now as it's changing over where I have been always the person involved with each production. I'm more going to be looked at as an EP in the aspect of like, are we good? Or was everything like making sense with the budget? Because when I feel that they're happy, production and agency, now I am like full lane goodbye. Like I'm like, here we go. And so I'd say there's moments where yes, I could be handicapped by it because I would be thinking about things that other directors have the luxury that they've never had to. Um, but with wanting to still build the company, and that's where it's nice to think about things as a company rather than a me, is we can do both. And there's going to be growing pains. I'm beyond aware of that as the directing does scale. But having already the notion of me knowing that I'm not going to be the go-to of both but I do want to feel good about it and get updates but I don't I'm not going to be the one you know setting up an order list with set supplies I'm not going to be the one making sure the key grip and gaffers talk to the DP I don't want to have to do that and I think that's where team is incredible <laughs> if you were in my shoes right now and I, and you were asking yourself a question, what would that question be? Hmm. Well, I thought of one, but I was like, oh, shoot, I don't have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I mean, yeah, yeah, I guess I still don't have the answer, but I'm just going to say it is what would be the next big timeline that, you know, of accomplishment, because what's really crazy of what's happening right now is the things that are changing and getting to come in are something that were you know three years ahead from now on my timeline of Shay's brain um so i'm i'm excited and i'm wondering to see if you know where does this want to go with directing and overall with the company of does it just stay in atlanta 
do I want to go outside of Atlanta? Um, do I really, really like the idea of doing both? You know, more of me getting into directing, I could be romanticizing the crap out of it. <laughs> and I could get there and maybe, you know, not love certain ones. And, you know, I'm excited about learning that stuff. And I'm excited about, yeah, I guess what would be my next big time lump. And I would say my answer would definitely to be getting like a big full car commercial to direct. Mm. And I would say hopefully in the next, to be realistic, five years. Five years. <laughs> That's actually pretty good if you can land a big car commercial in five years. <laughs> well, now, now it's on record. So I got to get That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, Shay, um, you know, we've reached that point. And I want to say thank you for coming on the show. And where can people find more about you? And if they had any questions, do you have a Instagram? Do you have Twitter? Where, where are you mo most active? Yeah. So um, I have a website, shaycastudios.com, and then LinkedIn, uh, same thing. Whether just me, myself, is Shay Jones, I do have a LinkedIn page for them. And then Instagram, also Shay Studios. But yeah, I absolutely love to. You know, if someone's excited and has questions and is nervous and hesitant but ready to jump, that's like the perfect place to be to get the right chunks of information before they're, you know, maybe led down a wrong path. So I'm always open to, you know, communicating with people. Thank you again for coming on. Well, thank you. No, this is a really cool